Welcome to All the F Words, a podcast where two writer friends nearly 30 years apart explore everything we give an F about. I'm Gabby Moskowitz. And I'm Joanne Green. On each episode of All the F Words, we focus on a theme starting with the letter F, things like foibles. I love that. That's like a Jerry Lewis word, right? Foibles, <laughs> fortune, and foie gras. We'll share stories from our lives and our distinct generational perspectives and look to the experts for insights and ideas. Today, we're going to talk about breasts, not just any breasts, big ones. And the title of our episode today is F Cup. Did you even know that that was a thing? An F cup bra? You know, I I do. And it's because, <laughs> just like you, I am also the owner, for lack of a better term, of that particular variety of boob, big one. And so, you know, I figured you and I were uniquely qualified to talk about this subject. So let's get into it. I just want to say that Nobody told me that your boobs can keep growing after menopause. Has anyone broken the news of that to you? So uh, I didn't know about that. Um, I actually, I didn't know about it until you, can I tell this story about kind of what inspired this episode? Absolutely. Well, so the thing that made me want to do this episode um, was... You and I went to go see our friend Rebecca, who um, listeners may remember from our filth episode. She does incredible um, aerial silks, and she did this performance in San Francisco. And you and I, uh, and Fred, your husband, and our producer went down together, and you and I were sitting next to each other. Oh, and I think it was because there was a performer who had who had very small breasts and was in this like little something or another, and we were. You, we were talking about like, what must it be like to not even have to think about wearing a bra? What must it be like to be able to wear something like that? Because you and I are both fairly well endowed. And, and that is when you told me that you were now, uh, as per the title of our episode, an F cup. It's and that, that was new. So tell, tell me more about this thing. Okay, so first of all, Sandra, who is the bra fitting salesperson at Nordstrom's in Quarter Madeira, and I highly recommend her services to anyone who can drive to that particular Nordstrom's. (laughs) But if not, any person who is like experienced at fitting people for appropriate bras, you should do. I mean, I for years I bought my bras at TJ Maxx and Marshall's, like, you know, the cheapskate that I am. And um, they may fit, they may not fit, they may be flattering, they may not be flattering, but um, they may offer the appropriate support. Then there was my, then there was the COVID bra that offered no support, but was Uh acceptable for Zoom. Anyway, here we go. So I um, started realizing that the girls were growing. And Sandra says that my breast tissue is migrating, (laughs) which is, I think, a lovely way to say your boobs are getting bigger. And this is something that she says happens to 20% of people. Now, she's not an MD, and I haven't done any research on this episode because this is your episode, Gabby. Uh So you did all the research, but it's probably true that some percentage of women have um, migrating breast tissue past a certain point in life. And this can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on um, how you choose to deal with it. So my my understanding based on the research that I did was that estrogen is what keeps the connective tissue of your breast hydrated and elastic. Yeah, I don't and have so, any of that. <laughs> well, as the as you have less and less of that hormone, the breasts can change shape because the um, ducts and mammary glands change shape and uh, you know, this is for some people, this looks like sagging for some, some people's breasts can actually shrink because, you know, in, as you get older, you, you lose fat deposits. Um, but I guess you got lucky and, uh, or I don't know if it feels lucky, how does it feel? It feels great. First of all, first of all, let's start with the fact that I don't have breast cancer and, Given how many people in my life, how many women in my life, and now men are 
being diagnosed increasingly with breast cancer as well. But let's face it, it's primarily a disease that afflicts women. The number of women in my life who have had or have currently breast cancer is ridiculous. Now, that is largely, I think, because I am Ashkenazi Jewish and the incidence of certainly the BRCA gene, but other genes that we were not yet able to test for seem to be higher in this, you know, genetic subset. So uh-huh. um, I'm just happy that my breasts are healthy and that somebody is creating um, a bra that makes them look as good as they can look. So there you have it. Well, on the subject of breast cancer, um, do you do you know whether or not, have you ever been told whether or not you have dense breasts? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. As do I. And this is a common thing um, with women who tend to have larger breasts. So if you don't know, um, having dense breasts uh, has to do, uh, it it can happen whether your breasts are large or small, but it's a measure of how fibrous and uh, and glandular the tissue in your breast is compared with the amount of fatty tissue as viewed on a mammogram. Uh, I just had my first mammogram like three months ago. And... It's like an induction ceremony, right? It's yeah. like you've, you've joined the sisterhood <laughs> of, uh, yeah, something. I don't know what. I know. I was like, where is my Eileen Fisher tunic and, you know, my uh, gray hair? I, uh, it wasn't a hair hair. I found my first gray anything eyebrow hair last week that was where it started i got my first just one in my eyebrow that's not even funny i know it i know did you pluck it well i was getting my eyebrows waxed i guess i didn't even find it i was having my eyebrows waxed and the waxer said oh um got a little gray hair you want me to pluck it i said i would say there went her tip well, she was just trying to help me out. She, <laughs> did, not, she did not have to share that. She could have just gotten rid of it. Yeah, exactly. Well, it was, you know, it's funny. I'm turning 41 in, I guess, two months in March. And I'm feeling the awareness of age with that birthday more, so much more than having turned wah, 40. Wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> What? Oh, I'm so sorry, Gap. <laughs> Did you? What? In what way have you noticed this? Is there a, a little? Well, I fr- told you a about the gray line? hair, <laughs> and I have dense breasts, which I found out in my mammogram because I am now middle aged. So, 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 what do you do differently if your breasts are dense? Nothing. Well, right? I don't think there's really anything to do other than to be really consistent about getting mammograms because what happens is it can make lumps harder to detect so if you if you skip if you skip a few um don't skip think, any bottom line don't skip any don't, no. nobody should be skipping any um but it's just important to be really vigilant about that yeah and so. i just want to say and and this is going to be my brief commercial um that i pop in here about uh, preventative health we especially given the healthcare system in this country, we who are insured, and that should be all of us because there are ways now, thank goodness, um, we need to take advantage of the fact that insurance covers these kind of preventative diagnostic tests. And so when you are told that you are of the age to get a particular test, and this could be a mammogram, this could be a colonoscopy, whatever, do not postpone this. Do Don't not do your insurance this. companies any favors. Don't save them money. Well, and not just that. I am a walking example of why a preventative diagnostic test can save your life. Um, had I not had a colonoscopy as I turned 60, I would be dead by now. So right. that's just a fact, and I'm fine. So there, there's my commercial. Amen. Amen. Well, before we get into the more treacherous parts of having big boobs. Let's talk about the our origin, I guess our origin stories, sort of about what, well, what it was like. Did you tell me, did you ever read the play or see the play by Paula Vogel, How I Learned to Drive? I did not. 
Well, I was a theater kid. So, of course, I not only saw it, but also like did a bunch of monologues from it and read it obsessively because it was I think it had just come out maybe sometime in the mid early or mid 90s when I was coming up in the theater in high school. And it's about it's a really dark play. Uh, and it's about this girl told from her perspective, um, who goes by Lil Bit. That's her name. And it's about her uh, really inappropriate and upsetting se- sexual relationship with her aunt's husband, her uncle, and his name is Uncle Peck. So, but one of the themes is about the way Lil Bit had very large breasts and looked much older than she actually was. And I really, really, you know, if I didn't have a gross uncle or anyone who was doing anything bad to me, but uh, I really related to this way, uh, the way that she was perceived as so much older than she was. I I think I was like 12 when I got my period, but I, I definitely started developing breasts earlier. And I really started looking like a teenager when I was still in elementary school. And I remember starting to notice that older and older men were responding to me. And I became sort of conscious that it had to do with my breasts. And I also was really aware of the boys my age who were responding to me differently and of how different I looked from other girls my age. And I'm wondering what that era in your life was like for you. I know it kind of fraught because of your body history but well no it's not i mean directly parallel to your experience i developed early and my breasts anyway developed early and um i was mortified to learn at 13 when we were beginning to have some boy girl parties around bar and bat mitzvahs and that there had been some discussion amongst the boys in our group of whether my breasts were real or if I was wearing falsies. Uh, I don't even know if you know that word, falsies. They were these yeah. little... I, now like you chicken think cutlets, of, that kind of well, thing? You know, it's they were these like little padded things that you would wear to make your breasts look bigger. I mean, now we think of them as what you would use if you had a mastectomy, but that just shows where I'm in a different phase of life, right? Uh, so it's... <laughs> um, Anyway, I found out that these two boys had a bet. This is so sad. This was at, uh, at um, somebody's bat mitzvah. And the and in our community, that just meant that you were dancing to records in their living room, you know, in their house. And um, they were dancing with me and pressing up against me to see if it bounced. Oh! And isn't that so awful and so... Uh. I obviously was devastated and cried and wanted to hide and wanted to, like, bind myself with an ace bandage and make them go away. Fred, this is probably the first time you're hearing this story, I'm guessing. I, I this, this is like a memory. And um, so, yeah, horrible. Hated Man. it. Hated Man. it. And also, this was an era when boobs were not the thing because Twiggy mm. oh, was... Yeah. <clears throat> so the, there was a model... Um, that uh, f- in London who took the world by storm and her body was, you know, like that of a young boy. Absolutely no curves at all. She was a twig. That's where that's where she got the name Twiggy. And so absolutely flat chested. Isn't and- it crazy? Is this crazy? Like, I don't know. Can men actually conceive of the fact that their women's bodies go in and out of fashion? Like, yep. not just clothing, body types, body types. That's well, this is why I'm crazy. so great. I'm so grateful for my boobs now, because Perf. now um, everyone seems to appreciate mm-hmm. large, perky boobs. And everyone likes boobs. Everyone likes boobs. And no one liked boobs when my boobs were first growing. So you uh, didn't want them. They were like humiliating and you couldn't run. Uh huh. Um, Right. Running is really a deal. Um, I know as many people actually. And again, this is probably because of my um, background, my my ethnic heritage. I know as many people who have had breast reductions Uh as I do who've had implants. 
I don't know if you know this about me, but I had one. I did know that about you, but I'm glad mm. that you're oh, yeah. sharing it with our audience. <laughs> How big were you, Gabby? They were big. They were big. Um, they were it, so big that um, insurance covered a lot of my um, production because it was having a, a really serious impact on my back and my posture. Um, I would say I was about, um, gosh, I mean, I think sizes have changed a little bit over time. Oh, yes. And we need to address that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was pro- probably, I think I was like a, a, a G, I would say, like, like, very, very large. Um, and I, I, my breasts have gone through many changes, um, which I can talk about. Um, but I was 21 and I had a breast reduction and I remember it was like the first time I started to once, you know, I was all healed. The first time that exercise actually felt manageable. Um, it had always been, I remember doing gym in high school and having to run a mile around the track. And it was miserable. Well, it they was also like, didn't have bras for such a purpose no, back then. Uh-uh. No, no, no. And even, you know, I guess before the reduction, I would wear two bras. I would wear like a regular, when I would exercise, I would wear a regular underwire bra with a sports bra over it. But at the time, sports bras were kind of like, they were just, what I guess we would call a bralette now, maybe made of like thicker lycra material, but there wasn't, there wasn't, they didn't provide much that was helpful. Um, but, you know, with uh, my breast up, even since that reduction, um, that kind of got like change, you know, certainly with nursing and then with weight gains. And like recently um, in the last few years, I didn't, this is kind of, kind of crazy. And I have, very, I have very mixed feelings about this subject, but I weighed myself for the first time in a long time. And I realized that I have lost since my, I was at my heaviest, maybe six, seven years ago, I've lost 50 pounds wow, over the a- last, you know, and pre- pregnancy up and down certainly contributed to some of that. But um, my boobs are completely different. And it's it's weird. They're still, they're still big. They're still probably like on the larger range of things, but, um, I didn't know that life could be like this because they're smaller than they were when I got the breast reduction. I didn't know what it was like to, it's like two things. Some of it is really physical. Like I've gotten really into exercise and I run three, four times a week and um, I only have, I mean, sports bras are so much better than they once were. Um, but I only have to wear one of them. And, uh, but also the feeling of not, of, of being able to wear, and this is a whole messed up thing. And I don't want to talk about this as if it's like, as if it's positive or negative, but I do remember, and we talked about this a little bit in the episode we did about school dress coats, um, there are outfits that when my breasts were really large looked quote unquote sluttier on me or where my, where, where, you know, could be described, I guess, in a certain, in, in certain circumstances as inappropriate for various places because there's so much cleavage and because so much attention was drawn to them. And now I can wear a lower neckline and it doesn't have the same effect and I have it I simultaneously feel a sense of freedom and it feels like I'm just reminded of how messed up that is it is so messed up and we will get into that right after these messages f cup is the name of our episode today. And if you are a female and have breasts and wear a bra, you might know what we're talking about. We're talking specifically about larger sized breasts. And this is, of course, all relative. Yeah. Um, Gabby and I have both been through phases of our life where we've been self-conscious about the size of our breasts. And 
we both seem to be in a phase, and correct me if I'm wrong, where we're enjoying our breasts more. Yeah, I think so. I think I, I had a complicated relationship with my feelings about my breasts for a long time, because even when I wasn't necessarily feeling self-confident about other parts of the way that I looked, I always knew that I had great boobs, that it, that I that um, that they were sexy and that I was sexy because of them. Um, but because I it was like sometimes there's something about and we talked about this a little bit when we talked about pregnancy, but there's something about women's bodies in general. But I think especially when there is uh, an attribute of someone's body um, that is extreme in some way, and that is, of course, a relative term where there's this sense of ownership that people seem to have. I got asked questions about my breasts all the time. Like, were they kind of, you know, what you were saying before, were they real? Were, um, oh, I mean, the number of uh, mostly women and gay men who asked me if they could touch them um, off the charts. I remember going to a cousin's wedding and the night before the wedding, there was this party at a bar and her friend's friend, this guy, didn't realize that I was, um, you know, a family member of the uh, woman getting married. And he asked me, he asked me what size bra I wear, super drunk and gross, and asked me what size bra I wear, whether he could touch them. And I, you know, was like recoiled. But I remember thinking afterwards, who does that? Thinks that's an okay thing to ask people and a drunk white guy yeah 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 definitely like may we all may may nobody ever say something that gross but wait may we all have the chutzpah of a drunk mediocre white guy um so you know i i i it was a mixed bad because I did feel really good and sexy, but then sometimes the attention and it was just too much. So let me go back in time a little bit to my childhood where sexy was a bad thing. Mm. Okay. Imagine this. So the message, my mom had small breasts. My sister had very large breasts, actually bigger than mine. Oh, um, wow. And she was tiny, the rest of her, like, you know, no hips, no butt. And it, at no point was the um, tale told in the family that this was a sexy thing. It was something that you wanted to minimize always. Sure. And cleavage was akin to running around naked. I mean, you did not expose cleavage ever. Sure. And in my family, my mom was um, like a Puritan. <laughs> we were we were like New England Puritans, and. Yeah. Um, so the idea that you could expose a little bit, like I was never allowed to have a bikini growing up because that was, you know, just inappropriate. That was the word, inappropriate. You had to be covered and modest and you can see how well that worked, that messaging <laughs> on me. Uh, not. But um, so, yeah, so the idea of having a little bit of cleavage was never a positive now, well, what was it like for you and your sister having grown up with that? And then you go out in the world and you're getting responded to. Uh, very confusing. I would imagine. It was a lot of mixed messaging. And um, well, that's a that's a whole different episode, you know, about sexuality and the messages we get and how to integrate that with how we we actually our bo the messages our body. Like I'm getting mm. one set of messages from my mom and my sister and a different set of messages from my body. Um, so yeah. that, not to mention the rest of society. So it was, <laughs> um, there was a lot of discord going on there and, um, it definitely messed with me. And I know I'm not alone in that people of my generation. And in fact, people of different cultures where like purity cultures, I think we, we addressed some of this when we did that episode. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the F word was, but what was the um, F word? But we definitely <laughs> talked about this. Um, yeah, we did. Oh, we first did. time. First time. Purity first culture. time. Right, 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 right. Um, so anyway, cleavage. Now I have cleavage and it's it's be I didn't even earlier when my when my breasts were large, but just the shape. 
and the configuration was such that they didn't do that cleavage thing. And now they do um, because the breast tissue has migrated, to, <laughs> to quote Sandra. And I rather love it. I have to say, I'm enjoying it. I And I don't necessarily wear low-cut things. I mean, I don't wear low-cut things because, of course, in addition to the fact that the, the breasts have done something lovely, the skin is kind of crepey. So, you know, right. it's like you get one benefit and you get one detract, you know, detractors. But anyway, just, yeah, I'm kind of enjoying it, I have to say. I mean, what's not to be enjoyed? What about when you were pregnant? Did you get... Oh my Did God, have- I needed I needed a freaking wheelbarrow to carry those girls around. <laughs> they were gargantuan. I remember the moment where my belly got bigger than my breasts and then I was able to like relax for a minute. <laughs> but I then, remember. But then I delivered said baby and then the breasts filled up with milk and then they got oh, even yeah. bigger. I remember. I actually have a, a picture. God forbid anyone ever break into my phone but i i remember oh is that an invitation <laughs> yeah come on hackers no 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 just kidding just um, me no just me you... <laughs> <laughs> i i couldn't believe how big they were it was like i they were again like i i had the baby my belly had started to shrink down and then my milk came in and it was it was like they, they occupied, yeah, like, I need, I need a wheelbarrow. They occupied the whole top half of my torso. It was absolutely no, it's, crazy. it's really unbelievable. And, and uh, for those of you who don't know, milk comes in kind of all at once. So mm-hmm. in my case, first baby, I'm in the hospital and I gave birth, you know, in the, in the afternoon and I was going to sleep over at the hospital that first night. And I had to go to the bathroom and I got up to go to the bathroom and I walked by the mirror on the wall and had and literally did a double take. You know, it's like, who's that? Like I saw <laughs> a different shaped person in the mirror. Oh my and, God. And then I had to like zero in and see. And then I, then I looked down and to see if what I was seeing in the mirror was really my body. And it was. So yeah, it can come in boom, like just... And Within an hour. Large breasted breastfeeding is different when you have large breasts. A lot of as you know, I don't I don't think there was as much equipment made for breastfeeding when you were breastfeeding, but like pump suction cups and um nursing bras and a lot of that stuff is first of all not really made for larger chested women. They that's starting to change. But also just the ergonomics of it. I remember um it was tricky, like my friends with little boobs who would just like pop up their their um, sweater and stick their kid under. And it was very easy to do it really um, secretly, not secretly, but um, discreetly, discreetly in public. Uh, it was very different for me. And I really had to develop an attitude of if you have a problem seeing my nipple because I have to feed my kid, then that's on you. And that was good for me. But it was it was definitely definitely different um and there yeah, is and that's sort of be- and that's because you were raised by your mom now see in my mental neuroses about all of this the thought of someone else seeing my breast well, i could couldn't deal <laughs> could not deal and it was was also again 30 years earlier let's be real a lot changed in that 30 years but i was in berkeley for gosh sakes I mean, my brother <laughs> has never looked more uncomfortable. I, I, you know, I, I never ever would like whip a whole boob out in front of. Certainly, in, I, you know, in general, I wouldn't really do that unless you're I not was, a boob whipper outer. Yeah, I'm not a boob whipper outer in general. <laughs> um, and I would be particularly careful around male relatives because I didn't want to feel uncomfortable and want them to feel uncomfortable, but. My yeah, really, because it's all about them. Uh, well, I you was thinking kind of pushed him. I was like, you're going to break your neck with how far away you are craning your face so that you don't have to just, you know, look at your phone. 
look, I'm not going to show you any boob. He was so uncomfortable. Even if he just knew that I was breastfeeding and I had like any sort of, you know, some coverage, it was like just the idea that my bare breast was in the room was too upsetting for him. But that's a story for another time. Um, So there is kind of a misconception about large breasts. People think that they produce more milk, but that's totally false. Like how much milk you produce has very little to do with how large your breasts are or aren't. And how easy it is to breastfeed has very Mm. little to do with it as well. Um, More relevant is the makeup of the nipple. Um, Mm -hmm. That has a lot more to do with how easy it is for a mother to breastfeed, you know, whether she's, you know, going to get cracked nipples or mastitis Uh. or any of the various lovely things that can ensue. I want to be sure we get to this idea about vanity sizing and the Mm, fact that the the F cup, I do not believe is something that existed 30 or 40 years ago, I think. and even if one's breasts were the size of what now is an F cup, I would venture to say that those breasts would have been a D cup or something some years ago. The yeah. same way that there never used to be a size zero of jeans, and now there is. And I know that my body did not change so much that I went down three sizes it's the sizing that has changed. And let's talk about that for a minute, Gabby. Yeah. So it's so one thing that I do know is that um, sizing of things like pants, shirts, dresses, um, non, I mean, all of many, some of these things involve breasts, breasts, but um, sizing of clothing in general, um, uh, vanity sizing has started taking place. So like what used to be, let's say a 10 is now like a six or an eight, depending on the brand. And, and it's one of the infuriating things about being a, you know, a female presenting person who wants to dress femininely is that you, you know, you're a different size in lots of different brands. It can be really annoying, especially when there's a global pandemic and you're trying to avoid going to clothing stores. Um, when it comes to bras, though, there are many European brands um, where uh, the letters just keep going up. And I'm not sure exactly why that is or why it's always been that way. But certain uh, companies, like I know Victoria's Secret, actually, they do the opposite of of other vanity sizing, which is they... They size, they give a a higher letter, so A, B, C, D, um, to a bra. Like they, they, their vanity sizing goes the opposite way. They vanity size, they prioritize larger sizes. So, um, you know, what would be a 36C in an average, um, an average uh, l- lingerie brand uh, or, ne- or just another lingerie brand? might be a 36D or double D um, at Victoria's Secret, which is just weird and confusing. So how big would our boobs be there? Pretty big. I think pretty big. Um, yeah. Also, know. why is it that, for instance, uh, what is an F cup in Europe is a triple D here? So D, yeah. E is double D and F is triple D. It's not like is there's it, a double B or a double C. Like, why all of a sudden are we doubling stuff? It's super weird. And it again, it's this psychology and it's um, marketers trying to ascertain what women are most comfortable with. So someone, you know, the folks at Victoria's Secret have decided that everybody wants bigger boobs, obviously. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if we call a B a C and a C a D women will be happier the same way that, um, and I have to say, as absurd as it is, I'm kind of happy when my jeans are a size zero. It's sick. I know it's sick. But, I get it. you know, we, I sort of feel good about being smaller in that department. And I also sort of feel good about being larger in this department. So, I mean, no, very, like, no one's immune. 
we're we're impacted by this. We're um, manipulated. We are manipulated. And it's so interesting if you think about men's clothing, which, by the way, is almost always um, higher quality, made better than uh, than women's clothing. The is that true? Is, I oh, didn't yeah. Know that. Men's clothing is often simpler and uh, and made better because they don't buy it as often. Because they don't they don't buy new clothes every season in the same way that women are really told that we need to. Um, I mean, the the pink tax and um, the, the the true cost of being perceived positively when you're in a female body in this or female presenting body in this society is really like truly its own episode. Um, and the fact that everything just how much more expensive and annoying and and degrading it is to have to deal with all of this stuff is, is really its own thing. Um, it really was the best thing about the pandemic that we just wore sweats and stayed home. Yeah. And our, and our shitty bras because who cares? Right. Um, <laughs> but I, um, yeah, it, it's, um, as far as, as far as like the clothing and the sizing thing, you get a real runaround every time you need to figure out what to wear. Yeah. It's just not fair. It's yeah. crazy. Well, this has been a very enlightening and dare I say uplifting episode. <laughs> well, I just want you to know I feel really supported by you. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> um, what was the more than a handful? Th- I don't know. We could go <laughs> on and on about boob jokes. It's uh, Oh, no. My favorite was the pencil test. Did you do the pencil test when you were a teenager? I didn't. Do you What's even know what I'm test? talking about? I I can guess. Okay, so the, this was um, maybe it only happened at summer camp, but it definitely happened at summer camp where you the pencil test was to see if you could if you put a pencil under your breast, would it stay there? And then <laughs> you really knew that you had boobs that were too large and too saggy if two pencils could stay there. Okay, what is the largest? writing implement that you think you could hold under your boobs i don't i think that's like i could probably i could probably get like an ipad under there really yeah Yeah, i don't think i could but that's because the tissue has migrated (laughs) it's gone up and out and they're fuller and uh, all right this we, we better end this episode quick before we get ourselves into serious trouble Thanks so much for listening to all the F words. We are available to follow everywhere and anywhere you get your podcasts. And we are also on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at all the F words pod. And please email us. Talk to us about what you could fit under your boobs. We're at all the F words pod at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. And please order my book. It's available on Amazon and anywhere else you get books. Uh, It's called By Accident, A Memoir of Letting Go. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.